not know. That's a promise from our Heavenly Father, and I pray as you have come here today to worship, that you have your minds prepared to what the words of Pastor Bruce will have to share for us, and our uh, worship and praise team as well. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for establishing Conley Community Church many years ago. We thank you for those of you who have brought here to serve, and especially even now with Bruce and Carolyn and the spiritual leadership that they provide for us. We thank you for this day, especially set aside to worship you and pray now that we will focus on that and set aside any distractions that we might have. In thy name we pray, amen. amen. Well, good morning. Won't you please stand? And as we stand, let's stand amazed that we stand in the presence of our Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit this morning. Let's sing together.
see us in Montana about the end of the third day. He's looking online for places to find. <laughs>
anyway, so please, guys, come. We'll have a great time. We'll have some good food and some good fellowship. And we'll be doing an amazing thing for the community. This is 6 a.m. <laughs> That's, where, where did 6 a.m. come from? <laughs> 6, 6 a.m., I'm still sleeping at 6 a.m. So. If, if, if you come at 6 a.m., we'll find something for you to do. But just come, please. We'll, we'll use you anytime you come. So it would be great. Thank you. Hey, thanks for sharing that, John. Uh, we're going to look at birthdays and anniversaries now. I do not see Carol Ann here anywhere. She is the only birthday that we have mentioned. Are there any other people present? We have a birthday coming up this week that we can celebrate. Rhonda? Hey, George. <laughs> You're not the only one that's getting around it. I'm old enough to know better. I'm 49. <laughs>
take this any further. I, <laughs> okay, thank you. I will just mention that as you leave today, there is a special gift out here on the table for those of you who are fathers. Okay? And anybody else who wants to grab them. Okay, for a few minutes I'd like us to take a look at a passage of Scripture in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32, we're going to look at some selected verses there, but as before I read those verses, I want to just give a little bit of context what's going on there. Jeremiah has prophesied for 40 years to the people of Judah, warning them to either turn back to God or face the consequences of God's judgment. He has experienced no success in those 40 years, according to the book, and he was known as the weeping Okay? He was imprisoned, he was beaten, mocked, betrayed, and eventually martyred. Jeremiah truly understood discouragement and suffering for the sake of his heavenly father. Now, as I look across our church family today in the sanctuary, I would ask you, what are some of the struggles that you're dealing with today? Health issues? Is there anybody in here who looks back fondly years ago when you could do things so easily and today you have the aches and the pains associated with trying to do those same things? What about relational conflicts? Within your family? Within your friends? What about economic matters? Is it getting more difficult to pay the bills at the end of the week, at the end of the month? Does that nest egg that you thought was sufficient, not meeting all your needs today? And last, what about your spiritual vitality? What about your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is it everything that you want it to be? Has it grown lukewarm? Do you ever ask yourself, does God really know what's going on in my life and what I'm dealing with? If you've answered yes to any of those questions, I would encourage you to listen to these verses of prayer that Jeremiah shares to his Heavenly Father. Ah, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. O great and powerful God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to all the ways of men. You reward everyone according to his conduct, conduct and as his deeds deserve. I'd just like to share with you four characteristics of God that Jeremiah outlines in this prayer as a way of encouragement for you today. First of all, we see that God is sovereign. He is always in control over all of his creation. It may not seem like it sometimes, but he is. He also talks about the greatness of his being. God made the heavens and the earth. Nothing is too hard for you. That's a promise from God. Also, he talks about the name of God, Lord God Almighty. The Hebrews had a special name using that phrase El Shaddai, which is Hebrew, that means God Almighty. That is who the God is that we serve. And last of all, Jeremiah prays and recognizes the fact that God is faithful and just in all that he does. He never makes a mistake that is not part of his character. He rewards everyone according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. That is the God that we serve, folks. And I'd like to close with just one more verse from Jeremiah chapter 31. It is a promise from God that is reinforced numerous times in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And this is God speaking to Jeremiah and to the people of Israel, but it is a promise that includes all of his children today. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. That word loving kindness we don't hear very much because humans cannot express loving kindness. Only God can do that. And the reason is because
because of its very definition. Humankindness is defined as when the one who owes you, when the one from whom you have a right to, de to deserve nothing gives you everything. That came out a little crooked, I'm sorry about that, but that's what it is. God owes us nothing, but he gives us everything. That is the God that we serve today. Okay, we're going to go into the praise and prayer portion of our service right now. I'm going to share with you a couple different prayer requests. Well, I'm not going to start from the beginning again. <laughs> okay, prayer and praise portion. Uh, let's talk about the praises first of all. Uh, and I will just acknowledge, we just got here at the beginning of the week, and it's amazing what you people have done with the grounds outside here. I mean, somebody's been busy working, and so, at least for me, anyhow, that is a praise. So thank you for those who have been involved doing that. Any other praises anybody would like to share, Dennis? This, I found Jesus in this room over here at the age of 77 in this church for the first time. Four of my brothers and one of my sisters, because I'm, I just turned 80, and my wife didn't want me up on the ladder. <laughs> These brothers and sisters painted my house in one day, and it is an absolutely professional job. I've inspected it. <laughs> and it's that kind of love that brought me to Jesus, and my favorite Bible verse is John 13, 34, where Jesus says, I give you another commandment, love one another as I have loved you. And that's what these, I keep saying guys, but the, uh, a girl also participated in this <laughs> Okay, so I would like to praise my brothers and my sister, Lonnie Maurer, Mike Schaff, Mike Martin, Phil Serena, and Sharon Serena. I love you all, and that's our job. Do what the man said, love one another. Thank you. Any other praises anybody would like to share? On that note, I, I have two praises today because I'm very thankful to Chuck and Diana because we had we had our finally got our stuff from Hawaii here in a little U-Haul pod. Chris was working and I needed some muscle. Chuck is not here today, so I hope I didn't do him in. <laughs> but it was just a blessing to have these guys be able to help me get it some stuff into a storage unit. So, yes, you are so right. Oh, we, we have such a, an amazing church family. And, yes. And so I agree with you, Dennis. And thank you very much, Chuck. Oh, yeah, okay. And then the second phrase is that um, Chris, he would tell you a half an hour story, so I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I got this little text a couple days at work, uh, go, a go at work, and, and it said, I rolled the truck. So he was in a some big piece of heavy equipment, a dump truck, and uh, some piece of equipment uh, broke, and it rolled him, and he was fine. Well, I thought, thank you, Lord. He's with us today. Thank you, Lord. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, it's praise and a little prayer. We have a work team coming out next week from California to help us finish cabin one and dry in cabin two. So yay for people that come do stuff. And um, if you'll just pray for that. We have all the food covered and everything's good. There's so many praises there, but also they have a tall order for what they want to finish. And if you'll just pray that they won't like chop off fingers and those sorts of things, that would be great. Okay, Debbie has a prayer
I would like to ask for safe travel for my my USO son. He's going to Okinawa on a tour, and uh, he'll be gone a week, 20th to the 27th. I would pray for safe travel. Anybody else? Pray for safe travels for Lonnie and I. We're heading out east to spend three weeks with our family for birthdays and dance recitals. And our neighbors retired from the military, served uh, in Okinawa. So we're going to celebrate him. And um, just a prayer for me for Monday. I have a procedure Monday morning. I have a prayer. Um, I would like to pray for the Missoula County. Uh, permit system. I need to get permits <laughs> done so I can build my cabin. And I've been on the telephone with them and had some fiery words, but at the very end, I was very loving to them. And so <laughs> I just want to pray that they get, get their work done. I can tell you from experience, Chris, that there are a number of people in this room who are very much aware of what you're going through. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other prayer requests? Darla? I'm sure you're all aware that our good friend Dave Davis went home finally on Friday. Um, it was a blessing. He was ready to go. Um, <coughs> Susan wants me to convey to everybody all your prayers, your thoughts, and your attention and everything that has been given to Dave and to her over the last few years, because as you well know, Dave had been sick for quite some time. Uh, she is planning on doing a memorial, and it will be in the fall, but it will be down in Mesa. So, And for those of you that do not know or know anything about Dave Davis, he came to the valley uh, it's been over 20 years ago. We were still meeting in the community hall when Dave and his first wife, Joanne, uh, moved up here, had a home built up up here. And I will tell you that over the years, um, the friendship that we had formed between Ray and myself and Dave and Joanne, and then when Joanne passed, Dave remarried, um, has been wonderful. He was truly a devoted Christian, and there is a lot of Dave Davis in the old section, and I call it old, but it's not really all that old, through Dave's financial help, through his volunteering and doing things, Dave Davis's hands is in this church. He loved the church, he loved the people in it, and he will be dearly missed. And I just say though that Susan needs a lot of prayer. She's going through quite a time right now. Um, it's going to take her a while. Uh, but as we all know, Dave is in a better place. And he got to where he wanted to go. And he was definitely ready. But thank everybody for all your prayers and thoughts to the Davis family. Thank you, Darla. Uh, actually, Carolyn gave me this little note to read. And it kind of reinforces what Darla shared as well. From Susan Davis, thank you for your friendship and prayers at this time. We are going to wait till fall for a memorial. Thank everyone there. And if any gift is given, I encourage you to go to the Connick Community Church in Dave's memory. I love you folks and appreciate your friendship and prayers. Love, Susan. I would just share my memories of Dave and Susan. Our Buzz and Patricia's house when we used to have Bible study over there, I can see exactly where they sat the same place in the couch every time. And when they would get to go get up, his knees would be bothered. So, uh, yeah, that's just some little thing. And of course, for those of us who remember, Susan had a very distinctive laugh. So, anyhow, thank you for your memory, Dr. Anybody else? Prayer requests? Okay, let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come before you with our prayer request today. We're reminded of Kathy Sindelar, who recently suffered a broken ankle and is in the healing process there. So we would specifically mention her this morning, Father. 
There are a number in our congregation who will be traveling here and there, different places. And so, Father, I just want to bring them before you and uh, some of the issues that are involved in traveling when things don't always go as smooth as we want. We just pray for safety, and especially for Chris, as he did not have any serious injuries concerning the accident that he was involved in. Father, we want to remember Sue Davis and the family right now. Many of us have good memories of them as they lived here for many, many years and were active in the church. Father, uh, his, health, his health issues have gone on and on, it seemed like, for many years. And so, Father, we just thank you that he's finally in your presence now. And just remember Sue and the family, especially as they plan this memorial a little bit later. We want to remember this work team that is going to be coming soon from California to help work. We just pray for their safe travels and for the work that they will be doing for safety for them. We just thank you for this. And Father, we do understand the frustration many of us deal with from time to time with not only our local government, but our state government and our federal government. And we sometimes throw our hands up in the air and just wonder why are things the way they are? And it's beyond our understanding. And so I just pray for those in this room who are trying to deal with some kind of building permit or regulatory process, that they would be patient and that uh, you would give them grace as they deal with this. Father, again, I just thank you that we never have to make an appointment with you when we come before you in prayer. That we come into the throne room of grace knowing that you are hearing us, that you understand each issue that we're dealing with. And Father, I do pray a prayer, an umbrella prayer for our group here today and the issues that people may be dealing with that many of us are unaware of. Father, we know that there are people dealing with some health issues that are not mentioned, that they would like to remain anonymous, and we just lift them before you right now. And just pray for healing. Pray for patience. And pray that the grace of God might be evident in their lives as well. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. stand and join us in singing our next song, Speak, O Lord, and follow along on the screen.
Good morning. Boy, is it good to be back with you folks. I missed you last week. Did any of you miss me? I wasn't sure. I had just heard so many great reports about what a good job Chuck did, and I just, I am so pleased that uh, he's willing to do that. We're blessed in this church. Dennis shared it with you this morning. We're, we're blessed that so many people will stand up, use their talents, and um, just be in service to the Lord, whatever that might be. Um, Marita, you've got some young folks you want to take somewhere this morning? Okay, you going to bring them back? Yes. All right. We'll let them go now. What a crew. A sparkly top. I almost wore my sparkly top this morning. I want to welcome uh, our visitors here this morning. We're glad to have you here with us. I, it's good to see old friends that we haven't seen for a while. You know, being gone, it, well, I just miss my church family when I'm not here on Sunday. But uh, a lot of you have been kind. You asked me, you know, how our trip went. Did I enjoy uh, our time? Um, I don't like missing church. I don't like leaving Montana. I especially don't like going to Western Washington. And I thought I would take a little survey this morning. How many of you just love going to a graduation? Is that your favorite thing that you've ever done? So anyway, um, I was told that I enjoyed visiting with the family, though. So that's, that's always kind of special. But we, I am really glad to be back. And we're going to continue this morning by taking an offering. So I'd ask the ushers to come forward at this time and do that if they would, please. I was gone one week and somebody stole my chair. <laughs>
Well, happy Father's Day. I hope you're having a good one. I appreciate the fact that Bruce started with who's the oldest father and not who has the most children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. <laughs> we wouldn't want to go that route. We're going to continue with Romans 15 today, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 16. We, we still have about a chapter and a half to do in this book, but if you're paying close attention, and I know you are, you, you kind of watch Paul's tone here, and you can see that he's gradually starting to bring this letter to a close. He's discussed some very, very weighty theological issues with us in the first 11 chapters, and then he, he transitioned into a practical application, how that affects our day-to-day -day life, what our day-to-day -day life as a Christian should look like. And now he's beginning to speak of his personal relationship with these Roman Christians, those that are original recipients of this letter. So Romans 15, we're going to begin in verse 14. And as always, before we go to Scripture, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I lift this time up to you. And it's just my earnest appeal now, Lord, that you would just set me aside completely and speak through me. I pray for revelation of your word here through the intervention of your Holy Spirit, Father. We just thank you so much that you saw fit to preserve these ancient words through all this time. We thank you for what they mean to our lives, and we pray that we would take them, Father, within our minds and our hearts, and they would help us to live our lives as we should as followers of you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 14, and concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Ministering as a priest, the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So Paul begins here in verse 13 and he lists three qualities that he says that the Roman Christians possess. First, he tells them that they are full of goodness. In other words, their motives are right. Their motives were pure. They were motivated by compassion to reach out to people in need. They were motivated by Christian love to share with one another and to carry and to share each other's burdens. Secondly, filled with all knowledge. Well, we need to qualify that a little bit. The Apostle Paul does not mean here that they know everything that there is to know about the Christian faith, everything there is to know about God, no matter how much a person may know in these areas, there is always more to learn. The riches of God's truth are inexhaustible. Even so, even so, the Christians in Rome were diligent. They were diligent students of God's word, and they were immensely committed to understanding God's will. So Paul affirms them by saying, you are filled with knowledge. Third, Paul says, you're able to admonish one another. A more literal translation of that phrase might be, you're competent to counsel one another. In many churches today, most of the counseling falls to the pastor. He's the listening ear. He's the problem solver for the congregation. But that was not God's intended plan for the church. God intended that the entire congregation, in one manner or another, be involved in this work of counseling. In the body of Christ, there should be many counselors. Counselors to help people define sound, biblical-based solutions to their problems and spiritual comfort for their hurts, for their sorrows, for their grief. The Christians in Rome lived out God's plan for the church as a place of healing. 
They were competent to counsel and to instruct one another. And I have to brag on you a little bit. I see that in this church. This happens in this church more than any place I have ever been. You, you, you heard it this morning. You reach out to each other. You comfort each other. I cannot possibly do all of that myself. I don't have the life experiences that some of you have. I haven't suffered the same sorrows and griefs as some of you have. I can't come alongside a person that has lost their spouse and say, I know what you're going through because I don't. But some of you can. And that is a ministry that God has given you. And I'm proud of this church that you folks do that. So, listening to what Paul says in this first verse, you'd think that a church that was full of goodness, competent in knowledge, and competent to counsel would need no word of reminder. But we see here Paul tells them that there are three things that he wants to remind them of. First, they needed a bold reminder of the truth. Look at verse 15 again. I have written you very I have written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you. We need to be reminded again and again the great news of the gospel. That is why we need to gather together in church and worship and listen for instruction every Sunday. You know, Bruce uh, hit on this in his opening, and I, I appreciate it. Just living our everyday lives, it is easy to get drawn into the mindset of the world around us. We need to continually be brought back to the great truths of faith, the great truths of Scripture. Paul told us back in Romans 12, verse 2, that we need to continually transform by the renewing of our mind. Carolyn and I missed one Sunday with you folks and went to a very populated area, and believe me, before I was there very long, I needed my mind renewed. My <laughs> attitude was slipping considerably. In our day-to-day -day life, that is easy to do. We need to be reminded of the good news of the gospel, what Jesus Christ has done for us. Second, the Christians at Rome and the Christians today need a minister. Paul says he has written to them in verses 15 and 16, because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles ministering as a priest the gospel of God. Paul is saying that God had given him the privilege of being the Lord's minister to the Gentile communities. My special calling, he's saying, is like that of the Old Testament uh, temple priest, working to awaken a sense of worship within the folks, a realization of the greatness of God. Again, as I've already um, alluded to, sometimes our spiritual lives can just drift. They can become boring. They can become lifeless. And we need to be reminded of how great God is. Throughout Romans, the Apostle Paul has done that. If you go back to the book of Isaiah, and you go to chapter 6, Isaiah's calling, and Isaiah had this vision. You remember that? Isaiah had this vision of God and his temple, and the magnificence and the power and the wonder and that, and that propelled him through decades of ministry. We need to do our best to, to get that vision of just how powerful, how great, how wonderful, and what God has done for us. Third, Paul said they needed to become sanctified. Paul says he's written to them again in verse 16, and he says there, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We've talked a lot about this process of sanctification, that for every believer, once you have accepted Jesus Christ, genuinely accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this process of sanctification begins, and it will continue until you're at home with the Lord. But this process needs to be experienced by a body of believers too. It needs to be experienced by a congregation. This 
sanctification processes by which the righteousness that we receive from God begins to gradually change our attitudes, our habits, our speech, our conduct. And as we as individual Christians and as a body of believers grow in sanctification in Christ, people notice that we're becoming more and more Christ-like. A group of Christians that is not, is not being sanctified by the Holy Spirit is just a religious organization, period. But a sanctified church is the living body of Jesus Christ. To borrow from the words of Ezekiel, when the divine winds of spirit blow upon the dead, dry bones of a church, those bones spring to life. That is sanctification. From the beginning of Paul's ministry to the very end, Paul was acutely <coughs> conscious of the burden that Christ had placed upon him as an apostle of the gospel of Christ Jesus. He knew that it was his duty to communicate the full counsel of God. And that burden has been shared by every earnest minister of the gospel ever since. The pulpit is not a place for the minister to opine his personal preferences or insights. The pulpit is where the word of God is to be proclaimed. And the burden of everyone, everyone who stands in it, is to make sure <clears throat> that the entire word of God is to be given to the people of and I have to add, considering the day and age that we live in, that that word be delivered with absolute truth and accuracy, period. Paul also understood that his very engagement in ministry was a matter of God's grace. Paul had not earned, listen to this, Paul had not earned his role. By no merit had Paul gained his role as apostle to the Gentiles. If you remember the story, Jesus Christ met him on the road to Damascus. And he called Paul while Paul was spewing out hate and venom against the church of Jesus Christ. The only thing, the only thing that Paul earned was the title that he gave himself later on in 1 Timothy chapter 1 when he called himself the worst of sinners. He became an apostle and a spokesperson for Christ by grace, by grace, and by grace alone, not by merit. And the same is true for all who would dare to open the Bible and presume to preach or teach from it. We are warned in Scripture to be very slow to be a teacher because you will be held to a higher standard. Paul is an apostle called to proclaim not his message, but the message that belongs to God and comes from God. And that is true of every preacher or teacher today. You know, there's one point here that I, I kind of feel the need to clarify. In verse 16, I was reading from the New American Standard, and it says that Paul ministered as a priest. And I believe of the more modern translations, the popular ones, the ones most of you are using, the NASB is the only one, the only translation to use that terminology. And it's not the best translation in this case. The New Testament, or in the New Testament, those appointed to preach and to teach are usually called pastors maybe elders, maybe shepherds, and sometimes ministers. But strikingly absent from the New Testament is this title, priest. That word is almost completely absent from the New Testament, and yet it was regularly applied to those who stood between the people and God as intercessors to offer sacrifices in the Old Testament. The title is referenced to the priesthood corporately, not individual, individually, in the New Testament. For example, in 1 Peter 
chapter 2, verse 9. But there Peter mentions the royal priesthood to which Israel was called. So again, Peter is using the word corporately then, not individually. The office of pastor is not called the office of priest because the function of the Old Testament priest reached its fulfillment in the offering of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament was done away with once and for all in Christ. Today, some groups still practice sacerdotalism. That can be your word of the day if you want to write that down, sacerdotalism. And what that means is that, uh, well, and by the way, it, it, most notably, our Catholic friends. That's, that's what they practice. And they believe that there is still a need for a priest to um, mediate between God and man. They believe that salvation is mediated uh, through the sacraments, and therefore through the priesthood. In such cases, the church is seen as the instrument that brings people to salvation. And understand, if you're a historian, if you've studied this, this issue is absolutely central during the 16th century Protestant Reformation. We believe that the priesthood of Christ was fulfilled on the cross, so we're not priests. Paul does not consider himself a priest. He calls himself a minister of of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. We believe, as we're told in Scripture, for example, in Ephesians 3.12, that since the cross, every believer, all believers, can approach God with freedom and with confidence. As Bruce said, we never have to make an appointment. We never have to go through anybody else. We can approach the throne room of God with boldness. What a blessing. Amen. But as we see in today's verses, although Paul does not call himself a priest, he borrows the language of the priesthood, and he uses it in a metaphorical way. Either, <clears throat> either in the letter Paul had written, excuse me, I missed a week, so <laughs> my mouth is just tongue-tied this morning. Earlier in the letter, Paul had written, back in chapter 12, verse 1, and there he said, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We do not offer bulls and goats and lambs or any other kind of animal anymore. But we are called to make a sacrifice to Christ, and that offering is our very lives. That has to be our response to the gospel. And in that sense, then, every Christian is a priest. But the offering is a sacrifice of praise. Understand that difference. It's important. It's an offering of sacrifice of praise. It's an offering of the sacrifice of worship. It is not an offering of atonement. Our atonement was satisfied, complete. It is done. It is over in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, period. So we see here that Paul uses the concept of the offering in somewhat an unusual way in verse 16. He says, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable. <clears throat> Paul has proclaimed the gospel of God to the Gentile community. And the Holy Spirit has worked through Paul's ministry to bring these Gentiles to a point of conversion. That, Paul is saying, is his sacrifice. That is the fruit of his ministry. His sacrifice is the Gentile converts. Now, not for a minute is Paul suggesting that he had the power to, to bring these folks to a, a point of conversion. He understands that that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, as a minister, he offers the fruit of his ministry to the Lord. And in that sense, metaphorically speaking, Paul exercises the office of priest. You know what I'm going to ask you? 
I ask you every Sunday, and I'm going to keep asking you because I don't want this to become a religious organization without feeling the power of the Spirit. You feel the power of the Spirit in this church? I do. And I think it's here. And if you're a person sitting here today and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're not sure whether you have or not, and you feel the Spirit, that, you say, we, we listened to you for half an hour, that's not me speaking to you right now, okay? I'm the one making the noise. But if you're feeling a need to either for the first time in your life accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you're feeling the need for assurance of that acceptance, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And I'd love to talk to you if that is the case. I'm going to ask you to continue to pray for revival. And as always, pray that it start right here in this church. Pray that it would start in this community. If you have picked an individual, a group, a family to pray for, please continue to do that. And join me in prayer as we close. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for this body of believers. I thank you for their willingness, Father, to just serve you in any manner that you have called them to. I pray that we would see that grow, that we would see that blossom. I pray that this community would not miss the light of your Holy Spirit, which is at work in each and every person in this congregation, Father. And again, I just pray that uh, we would be powerful witnesses of you and your Son. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.